In this video, we're going to continue our analysis of one-dimensional steady-state conduction systems, specifically the plane wall, and we're going to introduce this concept of thermal resistance. So if you recall from previous lectures, that when we solve the heat equation under this special case where you have constant thermal conductivity, your system is at steady state, and you have no generation happening within the solid, you get a temperature profile that looks like this. It is a straight line, constant slope. That implies that your flow of heat as a function of x is also constant. That's what this figure shows. This figure also shows uh, some convection happening on the left and right. We will ignore that for now. But what you see with these lines are the, this is a plot of the temperature or the temperature profile superimposed on a diagram of the system. So you could think of this as, well, that's a terrible, terrible axis. So if this is a T versus X plot, here's how our temperature profile looks like with respect to our system. And alternatively, this could be a Q versus X plot, and you would see that our Q is totally constant through the system. So the way we get there, first of all, we know that it's constant in the solid because we solved the heat equation. We knew that the second derivative was zero, the first derivative is constant, meaning that the temperature itself is a straight line. So temperature changes linearly with x in the solid. The flow and the flux and the flow of heat are both also constant with respect to x. And if we did a surface energy balance here on each side, just right at that surface, if our if this were a control surface, we would see that the heat coming in by convection would be the same as the heat going out by conduction. Similarly, on the right side, we could see that the heat coming in by conduction would be the same as the heat leaving by convection. So we could equate this conductive flow of heat to the convective flow of heat. And if we rearranged, we could put all of those equations in this same basic format. So we could say the flow of heat in the x direction is equal to the heat coming into the left boundary by convection, and then the heat through the solid itself, and then that would be equal to the heat leaving. But you notice that in each of the denominators, instead of having h1 times a in the numerator, we've put the inverse of h1 times a in the denominator, and there's a reason for that. Similarly, instead of having ka over l multiplying this delta t, we have l divided by ka in the bottom. So this particular form is done for a reason. You'll notice that the numerators in each of that case are very similar. They're all a delta t, one temperature minus another temperature. So there is our delta t driving force. So while that delta t may be different through each layer, each of those terms is balanced out with the denominator, which is this, I'm going to call r, sometimes you see it as r sub t, which is the thermal resistance of that particular layer. And as you can tell, because all of these terms are, are equal to each other, as we've proven with the heat equation and energy balances, we can see that the delta T in each case must be balanced out by the thermal resistance. So this will define what these thermal resistances mean for convection and conduction in just a moment. But what we can also do is we can look at this system as a whole because of this nice form delta T over R, we could actually combine layers, and instead of looking at a delta T from just here to here, we could actually look at a delta T from the airspace on each side all the way through the solid into the other airspace, and we would get a form that looks more like this. So here, we would look at uh, our fluid temperature on the left minus our fluid temperature on the right, and we would divide that by the total thermal resistance and that, even though we're looking at heat transfer all the way through, we can still equate that delta T over R to any of these terms that we see above. So this is a, one of the really convenient things that, um, that comes from this thermal resistance method. <clears throat> okay, so you can think about this as a thermal circuit, just like in a an electric circuits class where you can, can assume a 
constant current all the way through the system, but the voltage may drop. So here, temperatures are analog analogous to those voltages. So if we, this is what's called a thermal circuit. You can see it has resistors here, and it has these nodes. So each of these nodes corresponds to a distinct temperature. So this first node represents the air temperature on the left, and we're going to assume that to just be well mixed. This next node it represents the surface temperature here, and then we have the surface temperature here, and then we have the air temperature on the far right hand side. So that's what all the temperatures represent. As in a, an electric circuit, each time your, your flow of electricity encounters resistance, you see a voltage drop. So you'd see a voltage drop. In the case of a thermal circuit, you, when you encounter a thermal resistance, you would see a temperature drop. So we can take this delta T and um, account for that delta T because of this thermal resistance by convection. Similarly, we would account for this delta T because of this thermal resistance by conduction. And then we could figure out what our total temperature drop is by considering the total thermal resistance. So that's what each part of this thermal circuit represents, and it's completely analogous to an electric circuit. So the thermal resistance by conduction through a plane wall is defined as L over Ka, and that comes just by by rearranging the integrated form of Fourier's law. So we get that our thermal resistance is L over Ka. So let's think about that a little more. If we have a wall, L is our wall thickness, a thicker wall will create more resistance to heat transfer. So that will make this conductive thermal resistance term bigger. Similarly, a wall that is higher thermal conductivity, let's say it's a steel wall, well that's in the denominators, that higher thermal conductivity will make our thermal conductive resistance smaller. Whereas if we had something that was an insulator, like a fiberglass or some kind of insulative foam, K would be much smaller, the thermal conductivity would be much smaller, so the thermal resistance would be bigger. And A, if our area were bigger, you're certainly going to have more flow of heat. So if our area normal to the flow of heat is bigger, then our thermal resistance gets smaller and our Q would be bigger in that case. Let's look at the convective thermal resistance for a plane wall, and this is actually the same for other systems as well. This one is 1 over H times A. So let's say if we wanted to get more heat transfer here, we could increase the velocity of that fluid. We could move that fluid around more. So that would have the effect of increasing our convective heat transfer coefficient. If we increase that convective heat transfer coefficient, our convective thermal resistance will be smaller. We'll have less resistance to heat transfer, which would have the effect of increasing our total flow of heat. Same thing for the area. The bigger surface area you have, the less thermal resistance you'll have and the more heat transfer you'll have. So when thermal, <coughs> when these thermal resistances are in series, we can just add them together. So here's our convective thermal resistance, our conductive thermal resistance, and our other convective thermal resistance. We can add those together in series to get our total thermal resistance. And so we would add series thermal resistances, and then we could express our total rate of heat transfer in the x direction in this form where we're just using these ambient temperatures on the end. So this is really convenient. We can actually figure out if we knew if we knew thermal properties, well, let's talk about this on this slide. So why is the thermal resistance method useful? So it's really useful to quantify the heat flow through many layers without having to solve the full heat equation. If you recall, to solve the heat equation, we it gave us a lot of really nice information, but we had to go do this integration. We had to substitute in our boundary conditions to solve for the constants of integration. And we ended up with some really good information. We got the temperature profile of our system, and there are certainly certain problems where we'll have to do that still. But if we apply this thermal resistance method, we could actually do something like quantify the flow of heat without having to go through all of that integration process. 
we would only need to know what the thermal properties of our system are. So specifically, if we knew what our convective heat transfer coefficients were and what our area was, as well as our wall thickness and thermal conductivity, well then we could quantify the entire thermal resistance through that particular circuit and we could calculate the total flow of heat knowing only these two um, fluid temperatures on each side. We wouldn't even need to have intermediate temperatures. We wouldn't even need to know anything about the temperature profile of the solid wall itself. However, we could use this method to go back and, um, oh, sorry. This would, so this would give us a rate equation going through those multiple layers. But then we could also use this to solve for intermediate temperatures. So for example, we could take a part of our thermal circuit. So we could look at heat transfer from here only to here. Oh, sorry. Heat transfer just for this convective part which just has that single convective thermal resistance, so that's this term, and we could equate that to our total thermal resistance, so this would give us a nice equation that we could use to solve for an unknown, so we could use this to solve for TS1. We could do the same for TS2, and you can actually use multiple layers. We could consider the thermal resistance from this surface out to here, and just consider the delta T between those two and only these two thermal resistances, and we could equate that to either of those terms. So this can come in really handy. This is another way of providing us some good equations that we can use to solve for some of the unknowns of our system that we may be interested in knowing. So this is a really good shortcut method. It's really important to get familiar with using this method so that you can solve problems more quickly and easily. Although it doesn't give you all the full information about the temperature profile, it can give you some really good information if that's all you need.